All right, we are live. So welcome back to DAP University. So today we got a lot to talk about in our live stream. We're gonna start off by looking at a big use case for Web 3.0 that not really many people are talking about that I think is gonna be big uh, one day. All right, we're gonna look at that because you need to understand what powers this because there's gonna be lots of other things that are birthed out of this idea that are likely going to you know, really gain legs in the Web 3.0 space long term. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at a, a big bug that almost caused a $15 billion problem on the blockchain. We're going to look at a lot of other news updates that have happened in the space since our live stream yesterday. Again, we do these live streams Monday through Friday. Just subscribe, turn on notifications. You're going to find out about these whenever you go live. We're going to take a quick look at the crypto markets, answer some of your questions, and a whole lot more. So if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory, and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to know how to master blockchain step-by-step -step start to finish, then head on over to dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. All right, so we got people jumping in the chat here. we got Automatic Beats. Uh, Teb is it Tebo or is it Tebow? I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, Christian, I hope I'm saying that right as well. Uh, Lord Jen, Fausto, Norris, Yeast, uh, Hardik, uh, Yash. Welcome, 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 Larry. All right, so let's jump into this. Let's talk about a big uh, use case for Web 3.0, a big idea that not that many people are talking about, okay? And there's actually some core sort of ideas inside of this. Um, that you need to understand if you're trying to get in this space because, you know, the more that you understand what you can do about blockchain and the, the greater fundamentals that you have of what this technology is actually capable of, that's going to really make you dangerous inside this industry to come up with new ideas and also just show your competence if you're trying to break into this space, okay? And also just figure out where the space is headed. So let's take a look at this. Uh, the reason I'm talking about this is because I actually saw this article uh, published this week uh, that talks about this. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty small article. It wasn't widely distributed on social media, but that had a lot of cool ideas in it. And I want to kind of break that down and talk about it as our first topic in our live stream today. So basically, uh, I saw this article come on Medium, talking about Web3 and the rise of small media, okay? And I want to talk about some problems that this article highlights and what some solutions are with Web 3.0, because I can definitely see this being a large, uh, widely adopted use case. You know, we talk about the adoption trends for blockchain technology being adopted twice as fast as the Internet was at the same number of users in the late 90s. One of the reasons for that is because we keep adding reasons on why people would want to use the technology in the first place. And not, it pro part of it is because there's so many problems that it solves. And right now we're going to look at uh, some particular problems that mo most people aren't really focusing on that much. Talking about DeFi, NFTs. But here's uh, some, some cool ideas on how we can really get the potential out of Web 3.0. So I'll just read the first part of this article and then talk about the high-level bullet points. So you, yes, you, are you human? <laughs> So you watching this video, are you actually a human? So it's not a completely absurd question to ask because the chances of someone reading this these words are about one, uh, one in three or one third. So basically two thirds of online traffic is made up of bots according to an analysis by a security vendor. Um, the security vendor. So what do these bots do? So many check web pages for reference, uh, making it easier to find content. Some people do bad bot things like trying to get into sites and many just click on ads. Okay. So I don't know if you knew that, right? I don't know if the stats a hundred percent true about the skew of traffic, but if it's anywhere close to true, let's just take it at face value. A lot of people accessing certain content are not real. <laughs> Okay, uh, and he, actually, if you see this, like you look at my YouTube comment section, uh, because my channel is related to crypto, I get all these crypto spam bots. That's why I used sometimes to say my videos like, hey, like, just beware of scammers, like, in the comment section, I'm never going to ask you for money. Like, in my Twitter, it says, like, hey, I'm never going to DM you and ask you uh, for money, duh. <laughs> like, if you go to my Twitter, it's literally right there at the top of the page, because we have this problem all the time. And so, like, basically, non-humans on the internet are actually a pretty big problem, okay? They're a pretty big problem, because why? Well, if you have not humans on the internet, like, there's a lot of stuff you can do. You can do stuff like create, you can game algorithms, right? You can uh, start to, you know, do things like skew data. You can do all this stuff and create this massive uh, momentum with a bunch of just fake accounts and things like that that can really change the experience of how other people actually interact online. So that's just one element, all right? And now we also talk about 
Uh, things like, you know, people being able to prove your identity online. Are you actually human? Are you who you say you are? That's two different things. Are you human? That's one question. The other question is, are you who you say you are? All right. These are, these are actual problems that we face on the internet that are kind of holding back the potential for what you could do. All right. So those are the problems. Let's talk about some of the things you could do later. Let's talk about a solution. Okay. So the solution with Web 3.0 is basically using uh, things like digital identity um, to actually create these digital signatures to combat this problem. Okay. Um, and right now I want to pause and talk about a vocabulary word that you might have seen floating around in the blockchain space. Uh, if you're not, if you haven't, I'll just talk about it because you're going to see this a lot which is basically this idea of a Sybil attack or Sybil resistance, okay? So a Sybil attack is a type of attack on a computer network in which an attacker subverts the service's reputation system by creating a large number of pseudon... I can't... I don't know how you say this word right. Pseudonymous, that's how I say it. It's pseudonym. It's like anonymous with pseudonym, okay? Uh, a bunch of fake identities, all right? that have a name, but that name's not the actual real person, and then uses them to gain disport, disproportionately large influence. So basically, you game a computer network by creating fake accounts that don't correspond to X actually there, and then you 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 get influence, right? You see this all the time on <laughs> crypto Twitter, with like anonymous accounts who are just like shilling tokens and stuff, or like in the fake YouTube comments down below. Uh, so after the title of this episode of the book, Sybil, okay? Um, so when we're talking about civil resistant technology, actually creating blockchain technology is resistant to this type of stuff. Okay. That's one solution. Um, and, and a lot of this hinges on digital identity. Okay. And so we saw this in the article talking about like, Hey, what could be some solutions, uh, to having, you know, uh, you know, having authenticated website traffic or it, it was an actual person, um, you know, access this. Well, one solution is basically having a token of some kind, that proves that the person's human, okay? So again, there's two, two problems. You have to prove that you're human, number one, and then number two, you have to prove that your identity is who you say you are, okay? So that's when we start to see all these like proof of protocols, like proof of humanity, like you see the proof of attendance protocol. You are at this place at a certain time, location, all right? And part of that's using blockchain to do that. So we're talking about creating a digital identity, okay? Uh, well, the digital identity could accomplish both of those things. Number one, it can prove that you're human. Number two, it can prove that you are who you say you are, all right? And, you know, digital identity, I think, has a massive, massive potential uh, with blockchain technology long term. And it's a problem that not a lot of people are really focusing a ton of time and attention on solving at a large scale. Now, part of that's because of technical limitations. Part of that's also because of incentives. Like, a lot of people in the crypto space are chasing momentum of things that are already taking off, like, you know, NFTs, cryptocurrencies, all that type of stuff, um, which, you know, <laughs> it makes all that stuff really attractive because people can make a lot of money really fast rather than trying to be like the first person to crack these really hard problems that haven't been solved yet. Of course, there's always a ton of upside to potential for the person who does that the first time, but it's also hard. Okay, it's also really hard. But let's talk about some future potential for digital identity because, again, I think this is a huge, huge, huge uh, use case for blockchain. So one of the things I'm most excited about with digital identity is actually doing using zero knowledge uh, cryptography applied to digital identity. What does that mean? What, what the heck does that mean? Well, let's talk about what you could do with it uh, before we talk about exactly how it works. So um, let's say that you wanted to have an identity powered by blockchain, all right? And then you wanted to prove information about yourself without revealing like the actual information itself. Talk about privacy being a massive problem on the internet. You know, people taking your information, selling it to advertisers. You have all this information that's stored in centralized databases that can be, you know, exploited. Like if I, if you register for a, so you go, so you go buy something on an e-commerce website and you give it your, you know, address, right? You give it your phone number, you give it your email address and your password, right? And you know, you don't know who's running that website, right? If it's a big reputable thing on like Amazon, that's one thing, but if it's like some sketchy Shopify store, or maybe it's not even on Shopify, let's say it's on like some, you know, like a WordPress site that somebody hand rolled somewhere. Well, you don't know if they're like, well, you don't know what they're doing with your information. So, uh, you know, blockchain, you can basically create digital identities um, where you, you know, you could retain more of your privacy. All right. So let's see how that works. 
So let's say that you basically needed to prove information about yourself without revealing what that is. That's the subject of zero knowledge proofs. So a really easy use case for this is like, let's say that you wanted to go to uh, a website that requires you to be over 21. Let's say you want to go, you know, look at a wine and spirits website or something like that, right? Well, it, it's going to ask you for your age, right? You know, those stupid little things that like, just click the box to confirm that you're over, you know, 21, which is the legal age in the United States. Um, it's not really airtight, but let's say you want to make that better. Well, you could basically prove your age without telling the application what your age actually is, okay? So that's the subject of a zero knowledge proof. So a zero knowledge proof essentially just proves that information is true without revealing what it is. And this has a huge application for online stuff. So can you prove that you're a human? Yes, but I don't want to tell you who I am. All right. Uh, can you prove um, that you live in a certain city? Yes, I can prove that without telling you what my address is. All right. Um, so how does a zero knowledge proof? Well, you can think about it like... Uh, in terms of cryptography, the, the, there's a really classic example, like a Where's Waldo puzzle. Okay, so let's see here. I don't know if y'all remember that. Like, Where's Waldo is like the, like the kid's book where you, like, try to find Waldo in the picture. Okay. So how does a, how does a zero knowledge proof work? Well, you could try to find Waldo in this picture. And I don't really see him off the top of my head. I'm, I'm going to play this game. Y'all can pause the YouTube video and try to find it. But for, for a second, I'm not going to try to like look for him live on camera here. Let's just say that this is Waldo right here, right? Or just some, let's just say that's Waldo. It's not. But So basically, what, as you know, as you know as proof is, is it just turns back with proof that you found Waldo, but it doesn't tell Waldo's location. So imagine you drew a big black box around the entire picture except for Waldo. Or like, let's just say I zoomed in like a thousand percent on this. Like, well, my, my web browser won't let me do it, but uh, if I just zoomed in a thousand percent on this, sent you back a little screen grab just of where of Waldo himself, that would prove that I had found him. Okay, and that's how zero knowledge cryptography works underneath the hood. Basically, you just submit proof that you got the right answer, but it doesn't exactly tell you where Waldo's location is. And so that's how it works underneath the hood when you're actually creating the cryptography that shows you, you know, hey, I'm human. I live in this certain city. I'm over a certain age. I'm all this type of stuff. And you're able to manage this identity and give systems the information it actually needs without just vomiting all this information into somebody else's database that could easily be compromised or used for purposes that you don't really want to be used. Okay. I mean, privacy is a huge deal on the internet. <laughs> For a long time, you know, we we had so many people that were like, well, the only people that care about privacy are people who are doing like shady stuff online. No, that is definitely not true. Uh, we're definitely at the point uh, where I think a lot more people realize that privacy is a real concern. <laughs> that you know, some of these big platforms are just completely selling out uh, all your information. Uh, I mean, I think enough people have gotten their information compromised online too. Your your credit card, your email, whatever. Uh, you can just go to haveibeenpwned.com and you're going to find out pretty fast if your uh, you know, identity has ever been compromised to the dark web by any stretch of imagination or by it at all. And yeah, most likely it has, especially if you end up using passwords, on the same password on multiple websites. And it's, it's really funny. I get this a lot. Like, There's a lot of people that just don't realize, and honestly, I kind of forget because I take some of this information for granted, but a lot of people don't realize that you shouldn't use <laughs> the same password on multiple websites. Uh, why is that? Well, basically, if you've done anything like I talked about before, which is like if you've ever put your information into a, a sketchy like e-commerce site, and not even that, like if you've read for a crypto exchange that's not like Binance or Coinbase, or you ever bought a ledger, <laughs> all right, or you ever bought like anything online or registered for any site and use the same password over and over again, like one of those sites has probably been compromised. You can just go to the website, pop in your email address and see if it's ever been, you know, compromised on any site. And if it has, then whoever compromised that information now has access to any website that uses that password and email combination. So you definitely don't want to do that. And that's not totally blockchain related, but I, I take for granted that knowledge often and a lot of people just don't know it. So, uh, somebody says, what is the, 
website to check on this. Uh, have I been pwned.com. <laughs> so basically you put in your email and it lets you know if your email has ever been like hacked or not, has it ever been hacked? Has your email address ever been, exp has your login credentials with that email address ever been exposed uh, and like, you know, sold or compromised in any way? So what am I drinking? It's water. So, yeah, anyways, digital identity definitely has a has a huge uh, potential that is really untapped, okay? And I'm 100% you know, honest with you. you know, there, there's some limiting factors to making this really work with blockchain as the technology exists right now. There are some problems that are unsolved, and it's not like somebody overnight is just going to jump into this space and be like, all right, it's solved the problem. Maybe somebody who's an absolute genius could. Um, but... There's a ton of upside potential to this. And so another thing is like, um, what could you use this for? I mean, think about how could you implement it and what could it be used for? Um, well, definitely anything that, like I said, needs to prove your identity. So you could think about digital voting of some kind. And so how could you actually implement this? Because there's problems. Like what if you lose your private key, right? <laughs> you lose your identity. So I, I thought about this a few times and, um, one implementation is this. Let's 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 start off and say the identity needs to be issued by a government. Okay, I know that's a little bit antithetical to blockchain because we want something we want to create a, you know, a borderless system, a borderless currency, all that type of stuff, but let's just start and say it's with a government, a local government, like a country, uh, a state, you know, a municipality of some kind. Uh, maybe if it could be something else, maybe we have some big online entity that is now recognized as a universal identity, whatever it is, okay? So what they could do is you could have humans that essentially go through the process of verifying your actual identity, okay? And then, like, you have to go somewhere to a physical location and then submit a bunch of proof. Like, you submit your actual, like, driver's license, identity, birth certificate, passport, whatever it is, to prove that you are who you are. You get some sort of picture. You get whatever thing. And then all that information could be stored on your device itself, okay? So you could get a, a basically a digital identity with a private key that gets stored on your device that never leaves your device where you get some sort of recovery kit for that type of thing. And then when you're at that place, they essentially set all that up for you or, or with you. They verify that all the information that's getting encrypted into that is there. They sign off on it. You sign off on it. And then you get some sort of encrypted type of like thing on your device itself that they don't own. You totally own it. Okay. And then there's a recovery process if you lose that, right? Like you have to go through all those hoops again to essentially recover that. Like, that, you know, like potentially what could happen is they could have a log of, you know, what you pr pr basically the same type of thing. Prove that you are who you are without having to prove everything about you. And then you retain ownership over that type of thing. But then you have sort of like a third party ID uh, that verifies that that was set up properly that you are who you say you are. Now, I know it's not airtight either, right? There's going to be ways where people could be paid off, you know, all that type of stuff. But the whole idea is that you could have a much better um, identity system where it's like, and you could have, you could have multiple, um, you could have multiple issuers of IDs. So like, this is where it can transcend just like governments or like local governments where it's like, let's say the Apple wanted to start issuing IDs, right? So, um, and then like websites, think about like a credit card. Like you need to go to a credit card and you see those little checkout badges where it's like, here's a, we take MasterCard, we take Visa, we take PayPal, we take Apple Pay, right? So uh, those are valid payment methods. Well, what if they had, well, we accept these valid ID issuers. Let's say Apple want to start to get in the business of uh, issuing IDs to people. Well, maybe you go to an Apple store and you walk through all those steps that I set up, talked about, right? But then you have some sort of cryptographic link um, that says like, yes, this is a valid person. All right, Apple verifies this. And then like, you know, uh, sure, it's not going to be airtight for everything, but it might it might capture a large number of use cases where you need to prevent present a valid ID. Um, and then like maybe in really important 
examples like you have to come up with multiple issuers or you have to have a government issued thing, right? We're just scratching the surface, but there's a way that you could do it on your own device um, that doesn't require you just like vomiting all this information uh, over to a third party who could potentially uh, misuse the data. And here's the last thing I'll say about this, which is when you're talking about handing a bunch of data over to somebody, it's not always that those people necessarily have like bad intentions for what they're going to do with the information. Sometimes it's just straight up incompetence, right? Like, so like I said, if you go to some sketchy website, e-commerce website, you put in your credit card information, your password, like they may not be like a bad person that are like trying to rip you off and then compromise your information, but they might have really bad operational security and they could just straight up get hacked and then they took all your information you didn't know that they were really bad and then you know there's nothing you can do about it at that point somebody else has all your private information and so that's another big reason why you want to protect yourself online uh not because you're trying to hide anything not because you're trying to like you know uh i don't know you know you're not trying to like sell drugs online or something like you're you're just trying to not get hacked <laughs> So let's see here. Somebody says metadata is a key barrier for crypto mainstream acceptance. Somebody says it's not the premise, it's locally stored similar to cold wallets on your phone. Yeah, so the, basically the private key to the account would essentially be stored on your phone. So the information about you could actually be stored on chain or could be stored with metadata about it. It was some sort of distributed off-chain reference, but where the link to that reference is actually included in the blockchain with the cryptographic hash and then the access to, to that to prove that you are that person is a private key that exists only on your device. And the only way they can set that information up would be with, you know, third party custodians physically in person to verify all the stuff before it gets put on chain. So this Coinbase could do it. Yeah, totally. Sometimes they can never get verified on a certain exchange, and that's probably yeah. So this this guy, I mean, this could have lots of applications. Really, you know, it could be exchanges, any any place that quickly needs an ID. I mean, I think it would get adopted the fastest in the crypto space. So any like Web 3.0 based application that needs to verify identity. I know people are talking about like needing to KYC for DeFi or something like that. That'd be the easiest place to implement this type of stuff. Like, let's say that regulations come and DeFi now has to. <laughs> KYC everybody who uses it, which I mean, it could happen. I don't think it can't, um, at least on the front end websites. This would be the easiest place for that type of thing to take off, right? Uh, where you have some sort of decentralized identity management where, you know, you have a third party that verifies everything. We give this to you and then you sign the transactions and then like you just do a button click KYC. Um, I mean, think about, think about your MetaMask icon, like in your, in your, thing not just being your wallet but also like proving that you are who you say you are and i think that's huge because think about it this way like you know uh one of the big paradigm shifts with blockchain is that you're no longer a user of individual applications like you're a user of the entire network so like when you go to a new website like you don't have to create a new email and password like it's all in your wallet right like your private keys your password and your your address is your username and so when you go to uniswap you just click like log in right you just click connect wallet and you're logged in so you go to a new website, you, you click, you know, connect a wallet and you're logged in. And so that right now we have cookies on websites that track you across multiple places, right? But whenever you go to a website, you can say, hey, this website wants to know this, this, this about you. And you just take off the boxes that you don't want it to know about, right? Or you say like, with those of you are knowledge proofs that I was talking about, you could say it wants to know that you are a certain age, but not like what your age is. It's like, okay, I can get on board with that, but I'm not telling him my address, right? Like all this type of stuff. So there's all this granular control that you could give in terms of privacy for access to the information across websites. So, all right, let's look at a couple of things that have happened in this space. And I kind of went along on that topic, but I think it's a pretty uh, interesting one that you all need to understand uh, because I think it's going to be definitely a big, big factor 
Oh, actually, one more thing. I know I'm going long on this, like I, like I said a second ago, but one other big area this could definitely uh, help with in the future is with deep fakes. All right. So I don't think we've really seen the extent to which deep fakes can actually be a problem in tech. All right. So what are deep fakes? If you're not familiar, so basically it's using uh, there's lots of different things that could technically be a deep fake, deep fake. But one of the most common things is basically creating a video that looks like somebody else that's not actually that person, right? Like we've seen deep fakes of like uh, like Tom Cruise are floating around all the time, right? Like where it looks like it's Tom Cruise and they use AI to like change his face and like they get somebody else to do it, but then they superimpose like Tom Cruise's face on it and then people think it's Tom Cruise in the video, right? There's, and the real dangerous thing is like people doing this with politicians, right? Or like major world leaders and then putting and making the videos go viral. So I was talking about that civil resistant attack earlier. Like what happens if you put a, a video of some world leader right? And then you just blow it up. Like you have these bots to like share the video around and then it becomes trending on these social algorithms, right? And then you have this viral video that somebody says like, hey, we just launched a nuclear attack, you know, like something crazy. Like I'm not trying to scare anybody, but like that, that could happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so how would blockchain fix that? Well, with the identity, like I was talking about a minute ago, um, you could, you could apply this identity to like verification of credible media sources right like uh it could be for the media publisher itself or it could be like you know whenever somebody speaks in a video that they're able to like digitally sign that yes i made this video and the only way that could, you could prove that would be having the private key itself okay with that identity management think about it like a like a seal like a wax seal like you know you you write a you write a, a letter and you seal it with your wax seal they think of like a papal bull or something like that. Uh, anyways, yeah, you basically could sign any media with your actual uh, digital signature to prove that you did that. And that could definitely help with deep fakes, which I don't think we've even scratched the surface for what's possible with those in terms of like skewing elections, uh, all that type of stuff. Somebody says, can Dabby version help me get a product design job at a Web3 company? Absolutely. We have people go through the Solidity trainings, the coding trainings, um, who don't get programming specific jobs. They get business development jobs, project manager jobs, product manager jobs, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, all that type of stuff that are closely related to blockchain development or like work with blockchain developers or they have developers. And at the end of the day, people want to know that you understand crypto deeply if you work at a crypto company. That's what most people want, okay? And learning it from the inside out is one of the best ways to get that understanding. It will give you a massive, massive, massive edge. So my sister, is it hard to land a job without a degree? Um, at the end of the day, people care about what you can do. They don't care about what you studied. In most cases, all right, in most cases. There are some exceptions where you kind of need a computer science degree to, like, have that depth of knowledge or, like, I mean, let me rephrase that. Most There are certain things that require such depth of knowledge that many people who get to that level got a computer science degree to understand those things. I mean, people who are quite sharp who are able to get there without the CS degree but let, let's just talk about most people, right? I don't want to talk, I don't want to focus on the tiny number of use cases. Uh, in most cases, people just care about what you can do. So how do you how do you do that? Well, you learn the skills uh, in a different way. You don't need a computer science degree. You basically you know acquire the skills uh, on your own and then prove that you can do them. How do you get a job without experience? You get the experience outside the workplace. You build a project on your own. You create a portfolio. You show them what you can do and start applying for those jobs. Now that being said, if you if you're if you have to go to college, right? Like I say, your parents make you go to college, um, and then you have no other way around it. Like it's not bad to study computer science, right? It's not probably not going to really hurt you big time or anything like that. Um, but yeah, you don't need it. It's not necessary. Not required.
for most things. Most, most, most things. All right, so um, one of the things I did want to talk about before we wrap up here today. So you can see this. Uh, something that was a near miss on chain and also a big opportunity uh, for... Not, I don't want to be careful how I say that. I don't, I'm not trying to say there's a big opportunity for, for the hacker. That's not what I meant here. Uh, I'll talk about the opportunities in a minute. So Convex Finance addresses a bug that could have led to a $15 billion rug pull. <laughs> okay. This is absolutely crazy. So uh, blockchain security firm Open Zeppelin uncovered a vulnerability within Curve that could have led to exorbitant damages. So they basically uh, disclosed the issue via Immunify and the bug was fixed. So Convex Protocol, a platform that boosts rewards for those using the Curve stablecoin, has mitigated an issue that could have resulted in a $15 billion rug pull. $15 billion. That I think that might be like... I want to say that might be like the biggest, <laughs> biggest exploit that happened. So uh, basically rug pulls occur when a seemingly legitimate cryptocurrency project absconds with investor funds. The whole idea, if you don't know what a rug pull is, think about somebody like walking onto a carpet and then pulling the carpet out underneath your feet. That's like the rug pull when you fall on your face, right? Uh, so basically, opens up with a blockchain security firm uncovered a significant vulnerability in the security audit uh, for Coinbase of the Convex Finance Protocol. So basically, I think Coinbase wanted to, uh, my assumption is that Coinbase wanted to list them and the Coinbase's requirements as they go under audit before they did that. <laughs> they were doing the audit and found that if two of the three multi-signature wallet signers of the Convex executed a specific series of steps, they could gain access to a pool of liquidity provider tokens. Uh, so anyways, um, because the majority of Curve Finance's Curve stablecoins in circulation uh, basically, because Convex holds a majority of Curve's stablecoin circulation, considerable funds are at risk. The vulnerability can now allow uh, Convex's anonymous developers uh, in the form of two or three multisig to gain control over Convex's locked value, which at the time would have been about $15 billion. <laughs> Absolutely crazy. So be careful out there in DeFi, everybody. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, so another thing about this is you want to... Uh, uh, sorry, my live stream is up. up mess up here um i think about this is security auditing you know if, if you're if you're if you're really serious about getting a hardcore specialty in crypto and blockchain you know security auditing's got a ton of upside okay so think about it this way um you know security auditing is a huge bottleneck for uh you know pretty much every legitimate project that decides to go live onto onto the blockchain there's lots of people who want to do that and you know there's hardly anybody who's a good security auditor out there there are definitely some great ones out there but not that many <laughs> okay so that's a huge 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 demand okay so now you know 100 percent security auditing if you're gonna be really good um it's like it's not for everybody all right like i'll, I'll be straight up with you right like you got to be pretty sharp to be a security guard. I mean, you can't learn it, but you like there's there's no I'll put it this way. There's no real way to just teach you exactly how to be a good security auditor. I mean, that's kind of true for being a good software developer too, but like at the end of the day, like you can be a average developer and still be pretty productive in the workplace, right? There's like the the bar for being good enough is way lower. <laughs> For being a regular developer the bar for being just good enough as a security auditor is a lot higher it's like i'm saying just good enough like effective enough because somebody else can kind of clean up your mess if you're if you're an average developer but like if you're an average security auditor like it's not it's just not gonna work like you got to be really really good because think about it you're you're disclosing like what the critical vulnerabilities are think about someone flying an airplane like you know you don't want you don't want just like a regular uh like an average Joe flying your airplane or cutting open on your brain, right? Because the mistakes are indelible and the cost is high. So same thing for security auditing. So anyways, that being said, like you, you got to kind of already see that you have the proclivity for that type of thing. Um, now, I don't want to stop anybody from watching this video, 
to like learn it because knowing security auditing is going to make you a better developer to build your applications, um, you know, in a secure way. Okay, that's that's a great skill to have. And you should always start there. And if you find that, hey, you're really good at that stuff, and then, you know, you don't, you might not know that you're a good security auditor yet. And then you find out why you're building it, right? Um, and then you kind of take that next level. <laughs> Somebody says send in some average security auditing work. So here's the other thing I'll say. I might be a little hard on that subject. I'm talking about for big like production applications, like you, you know, where where you are sort of the final authority on whether something is secure or not. At the end of the day, it's a humbling job because nobody's perfect, and you don't know what you don't know. Um, you could you know you could quickly uncover security vulnerabilities with certain things. That's a different application of security auditing. I'm talking about you're the person that says, "Yep, all right, it's good to go." <laughs> You know what I mean? Like you, you issued the final report that says we don't see any, we don't see any high severity bugs in this type of thing. It's like, well, you gotta get somebody who you can trust to to really sign off on that one. Okay, so. Uh, Let's check on, uh, let's do a quick check on the crypto markets. I'm also going to check back on how Bitcoin's doing. All right, so here we are. Um, I got the weekly time frame pulled up. Uh, so basically, where are we with Bitcoin? We are at forty three thousand eight hundred and fifteen dollars and thirty two cents. All right. So what's been going on the past week? Been slightly, slightly bearish. Okay. Um, we definitely have seen uh, Bitcoin coming off of resistance at the two hundred day moving average. Um, I think there's a lot of people who are just sitting here waiting for some of the bearish indicators to go away and some of the bullish confirmations to really be confirmed before everybody's like, yeah, awesome. It's like go time for crypto. Now, the real hard thing is like volatility is shrinking. And so a lot of these indicators are getting really close to one another and kind of muddled. Okay. And sometimes when volatility is shrinking like this, it, it, it can mean that crypto is about to go up or down really fast. <laughs> Nobody knows for sure. Um, so you can see this in the past, like you can see lots of times when volatility shrank, and then you see <laughs> moves to a different direction. Sometimes it's the upside, sometimes it's the downside. So um, let's just look here. Of course, we, we came up and hit this 200-day moving average, uh, got rejected off of it. Right now, we are just slightly below our bull market support band, okay? Um, let's watch it over the next couple of days. So basically, if... If we come back above and close above the bull market support band, that's good in the short term uh, for Bitcoin. If we close below it, it's going to be slightly bearish. We'll probably continue to trend down uh, farther below that. Of course, you had a wick below it. We've seen plenty of wicks down. I mean, look at what we did here last year. Like after things recovered, you know, we got this kind of, we, we went above the 200-day moving average, wicked down <laughs> below the bull market support band in the same week. Okay. Uh, and then basically held the top part roughly a support and put in a green candle after that. So, yeah, this is a really hard market to read. It's really, really, and I don't think crypto is ever easy to read. But right now, the, all the, everything's like super, super, super muddled uh, and close together. So let me know what you think down in the comments section below. Are you bullish? Are you bearish? Of course, you know, my long-term outlook has never changed. Um, still seeing rapid adoption of the technology um, that's where that's where my bullish thesis is, but the short to medium term, it's really hard to tell. I still do think that a lot of the peak fear that's hit the marketplace is uh, probably behind us uh, in terms of like you know inflation fears, raising interest rates, international uh, conflicts. I think a lot of the peak fear of that is behind us, but 
we'll see. I mean, there's always black swans. There's always new crazy stuff that could come out that could cause more fear. But of the stuff we know about, I think that a lot of the insane fear is, is probably behind us. Not financial advice, of course. Um, but one other important thing is actually, you know, what's going on with the stock market. So crypto is definitely not exists in isolation right now. Um, you know, I've, I've been saying for a long time that the stock market, like crypto is pro like crypto is probably not going to just rip off to infinity if the stock market's like bearish. Okay. And, and part of that's the common factor of, of, you know, the macro scene right now. And then crypto being kind of thought of as a, a risky asset just like a lot of other stuff like a lot of other risk assets in the stock market you know thinking about growth thinking about tech all that type of stuff um there's a lot of lumping crypto into very similar baskets much we want to get you know uncorrelated from the stock market we're just not there yet okay and so i i really love to see s p uh others you know basically start closing the year positive <laughs> All right, we still got some ways to go before we get there. Um, we were pretty close at the beginning of March, or at the end of March, but we've been a little bare since then. So hopefully some of that volatility will subside and we'll start making some gains there too. Some of us think we're stuck in a uh, crab land for quite a while till a major catalyst comes along. Could be. Second, see here. Somebody says, but Kathy Wood says. <laughs> awesome. All right, everybody. That's all I got for today. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That really helps these videos out so that more people learn about blockchain. And if you're as fascinated with this technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? Well, you can go to my YouTube homepage. You can find my free courses there. They like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you want to take the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely, I can show you become a blockchain master step by step trying to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You'd have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.